This is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Would you please stand and put your attention on the front wall that we're going to appear to the first song.
and uh, of the way we do. And so there are a lot of friends uh, of James Cheddar and uh, his life and what who he was and what he was uh, is says wow we have folks downstairs uh, in the overflow downstairs uh, I'm not sure how many but uh, this room is filled and we have several more downstairs so that's a tribute to James and his life and we want to thank you for coming and supporting the family in this way and uh, we're going to do things maybe a little different today uh, after the service uh, normally we might go to the cemetery and have a committal service and then come back and eat uh, but today uh, with the wishes of the family we're going to eat right away and there will be a private and committal service later on today so as you're dismissed as the service ends uh, there will naturally be kind of a, a slowness and, and the first few rows will be able to get out quickly after the family goes and then uh, things will kind of slow down a little bit and uh, someone will come and, and usher you out, usher your row out because it'll take a while to get everybody through the serving lines. There will be four serving lines but it'll take a while to do that. So that's kind of the way we're going to end things in the best way we can. So you're free to fellowship with one another. We'll have a closing hymn eventually and after that hymn you're free to fellowship with each other as you see fit and then just, just wait to be ushered out. And also, uh, several of the family members are going to be involved in the service this morning. And so we want you to be aware of that. They're going to do a variety of things. So the first one that comes up uh, is going to be, Corey, would you please come? Paul. Uh -huh. We are there. We go. James Cheddar was born October 23, 1969, to Gerald and Judy Cheddar at Huron. He grew up in the Huron area and graduated from Huron High School in 1989. He attended Lake Area Botech after high school and then worked for PSIC Construction from December 1992 until he became sick this past July. He worked at Terex as a machinist. His biggest passion was the family farm where he also worked up until the day that he became sick. On July 3, 1992, James married Lisa Kemet at Fairmont, Minnesota. They made their home in Huron on Beach Street, where they lived all of their married life. He was a member of Mount Olivet Church, where he was baptized on September 27, 1987, and later served as a trustee at the church. James liked to work on his farm and go fishing, and hunting, and camping. He enjoyed watching his daughters participate in all of their activities, and loved teaching them and other children he knew to love and respect the farm as he did. He cherished the time he was able to spend with his family and his dogs. He was preceded in death by his father, one cousin, Jay Cheddar, three uncles, Jerry, Larry, and Trevor Cheddar, one brother-in-law, Scott Broders, and his grandparents, Elizabeth and Alfred Cheddar, Eddie Cheddar, and Katie, and Mike Walter. Grateful for having shared in his life are his devoted wife, Lisa, 
four daughters, Kayla, married to Waylon Walters, Bailey Cheddar, Sydney Cheddar, and Abby Cheddar. Two grandsons, Carson and Kason Walters, and another one on the way. His mother, Judy Cheddar, two sisters, Janet, married to Travis Peck, and Janelle, married to Corey Moss. His parents-in-law, Mike and Kate Kimmett, one sister-in-law, Mary Broders, one brother-in-law, David, married to Mary Kimmett, his nieces and nephews, Michael, married to Sam Broders, Jennifer and Brian Broders, Jordan and Caleb Kim, Taylor and Jackson Peck, and Braxton and Greta Moss. His uncles and aunts, Carol, married to Arlene Cheddar, Harvey married to Patricia Cheddar, Harvey married to Sharon Cheddar, and Mona Laguerre, Judith Cheddar, and Lana Cheddar, his great aunt, Suzanne Cheddar, many cousins, and his four-legged best friend, Zoe. I'll be reading to you from Psalm 23 this morning. This is a song that's written by a farmer. I think it's appropriate, huh? A farmer who knew a lot of good truths about life. He was a sheep farmer, among other things. And sheep are kind of helpless, I understand. Uh, they need a lot of help. A lot of these animals who farmers raise, they need a lot of help. James knew that well. And we as people are likened to these sheep. We need a lot of help. We need a lot of help. At times we think we can, we can do this on our own. The word is safe. We're weak. We're dependent on the Lord. And we have a good shepherd. So as I read this song, I want you to hear how God will help you in this very difficult time. Hear Psalm 23 in a, a new way, not just another psalm or another scripture to read at, at a memorial service, but as a promise from God to you. Listen, and I emphasize all that God does for us. The Lord is my shepherd, and therefore I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. Don't we need that at times? He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. To hear all of what God is doing. And here's what we do. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That's what we do, folks. We walk in a very broken world. I do that. I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Yet I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. So surely then, goodness and love, they will follow me all of the days of my life. We take great comfort in this last night. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is God's word for the people of God. 
We give Him thanks today.
I'm married to Travis, and my children are Taylor and Jackson. One day, Janelle and I were talking over the phone, and we were visiting about the possibility of James coming home, going on hospice. And to tell you the truth, I am. I was really struggling with that idea. And uh, Janelle said to me, you know, sis, it doesn't matter whether James is at the hospital or he's at home. He is going to live the number of days God has planned for him. And I knew she was right. And that's when I went to this verse in the Bible that says, Oh yes, you shaped me first inside, then out. You formed me in my mother's womb. Thank you, high God, your breathtaking body and soul. I am marvelously made. I know you know me inside and out. You know every bone in my body. You know exactly how I was made, bit by bit, how I was sculpted from nothing into something. Like an open book, you watched me grow from conception to birth. All the stages of my life were spread out before you. The days of my life, all prepared, even before I had lived even one. Or you can look at it in this version as well, one that's maybe more familiar to some of you. Your eyes saw my unformed body, and all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Ordained, I looked it up on the dictionary, means set into place, prepared, planned. The days were planned before they ever were meant to be. That gives me a lot of comfort. I don't have to worry about if we need to go to one more doctor, try one more drug, do one more thing. We made good decisions, we made the best decisions we could, and I'm confident in that. So with the idea of days, give me the privilege of honoring my brother and sharing with you a glimpse of our days, or his days, through my eyes. James grew up in one location, the farm. We moved there when I was three, and it was James and I. He was my playmate. playmate. We rode bikes in the yard, played in the fort that was made out of a circle of lilac trees in the back. We had a hammock um, that I don't know when I believe sent from Texas or Mexico. And we'd shimmy up high, he was between two trees, and we'd shimmy up high in the hammock. And then if you shifted your weight just right, you could flip the other guy out into the, into the lawn. We completely wore the grass out under that hammock, him and I. And one other thing, I actually talked with James about all these before he was in the hospital. And we talked about the stairway at home. We had a stairway with walls on both sides, and just a simple rubber bouncy ball. And I said, were you at the top, or was I at the top? And he said, he was at the top, and I was at the bottom. And we threw that silly bouncy ball up and down the stairs. I think about it as such simple childhood fun. But it was fun because I was together with him. I didn't need a cord or a charger for that matter either. <laughs> we got a little older, and our time moved up to our playtime moved up to a little 50cc dirt bike that our dad bought us. We got every penny of my dad's money out of that dirt bike. We wrecked it, we crashed it, we set it on fire. <laughs> At the hospital, I was trying to visit with the nurses and just make time go better for them and James as well. And the nurse in here on here is a male nurse, and I asked him, we was talking about Jackson, my son, and his love for Legos. And I said, did you have Legos? And he went on to say he had. And then he asked James, what about you? Did you have Legos? And James at this time was, uh, wasn't talking, so we were reading lips. And the nurse got the first part of what he said. He said, we didn't have toys, and then I knew the rest without seeing James's lips. We had work. <laughs> and work we did. We worked together. We picked rock with mom and dad, and we picked rock for a dollar a load, and the load was the tractor loader in the front full and the rock picker in the back full. One day we picked 10 loads, I had $10, I was really thought I had something. Another job we did was um, when you had a newly planted tree strip, someone would come in and take the weeds out between the trees, but they couldn't get close enough. And so we went out to 
pulled the weeds out of the tree strip. That's where I learned my respect for barbed wire, because I remember I cut my back, and I think James was holding the, the wire. Um, but also, we would go out, and there was six rows of trees, a hundred trees in a row, and we would meet in the middle, then, supposedly, except for one particular time, I'm like tree 40, tree 50, and I'm kind of keeping track of tree 60 and 65. I'm like, what's he doing? So I go walking down there. He'd smuggled matchbox cars out in his pocket. Had a racetrack built and all the dirt out there. <laughs> Sometimes that work interfered with our social life. I remember James and I running with push lawn mowers. And another time, I remember the field across the road, running to throw idiot bales on the trailers. Dad drove. We ran from one baler, one bale to the next to throw them on. And while I remember that, I can't remember what the important social life was that we needed to get to. I wish I could remember that as well. <coughs> next came college for me in Aberdeen, and technical school for James in Watertown. And I don't remember much about that time, except maybe James got in a little trouble here and there, and when the heat was on him, it bought me a little freedom. <laughs> Travis and James and I lived together um, up on Kansas Street for a while, and James worked for peace at construction during that time, so he was gone a lot during the week, and then he was there um, on the weekend. And one particular weekend morning, I can see him standing in the kitchen, pulling this crumpled piece of paper out of his pocket, and on that paper was a phone number. And then later, James left that day, and he went to do what we would do today. We would call it creeping, or stalking. <laughs> he went to check out the girl whose that phone number was. She was tall, her hair was long, and she was cute. And soon Lisa was a regular at everything we did, and all James thought about. Fly through the next few years, raising babies, hauling kids to daycare and to school, family birthday parties. James worked at Terex, and we sit Center for Independence. But James managed to get in some time for some of that hunting and fishing he so loved, and he helped Dad on the farm. I suppose this would be practice, for the time would come when Dad would be gone, and James would manage the farm for our mom. And soon James and Mom were thick and tight and closer than ever, and James became the golden boy. <laughs> we named him that, Janelle and I, but we had a lot of fun teasing both of them about being him being the golden boy. And Travis would say, your brother can get away with stuff nobody else can. Travis and James both worked at Terex. And I used to send a container to work with Travis, and somehow he was to get it to James. And on the top, I'd always write, love ya. Inside my name's Sis, and inside the container, I'd have some chocolate cake, some strawberry pretzel salad, or something else I knew he liked. And we all knew the skinny guy in the bib overalls could use those calories. <laughs> well, let's go back to the beginning, to our ordained days, the planned days for us. I have to ask myself, I have to wonder, what is the purpose of these last 200 days? Why did my brother lay there? Why was he so sick? I can't understand it. I can't explain it to you. But I know and I trust it was part of God's plan. So I had to look hard to find some good things during this time. And let me share those with you. For better, for worse, and sickness and health, for richer, for poorer. And so that was part. I was there, but I don't remember if James and Lisa said those exact words or not. But Lisa, you have truly been an example of a godly, devoted boy. You hung in there through it all, every bit of it. You gave up your job. You gave up your home for a while. You're gone from your kids. 
And I want to tell you thank you. Thank you on behalf of all of our family. You are an amazing woman, and I'm proud to call you my sister. Last summer, James, Lisa, Kayla Whalen, Ryan, Sydney, Abby, Kaysen, and Carson went on a camping trip. And I remember thinking to myself, that's kind of different. Okay, well, that's cool. That's good. And now I'm so glad they did that because that was shortly before James got sick. The message within that is that we should all remember to take time with our families. The work will always be there. Another really good thing during this time was Team Cheddar. I still love our red shirts, and I'm going to cherish that shirt. When part of the team is down, the rest of the team has to pick up the slack. Kevin, Travis with the farm. Bailey and Sid, managing your work, things at home the mail, the dogs, more than you ever planned. Abby, I know you had to be independent. I know you had to manage on your own. And I know you sacrificed the support of your mom and dad at your volleyball and your basketball games and all the things that go to school. And I know your dad would have been there if he could have been. He would have loved to see you play volleyball where you had the, Taylor had the set and you had the kill. Those were fun games. Also a good thing is the gift of encouragement we can have for one another. And I saw that in my own little Jackson when I'd be home and I'd be sad. He'd say, Mom, God has a plan. God has a plan. And so that day and today I continue to trust the plan. And my own daughter, Taylor. Taylor has a wonderful gift of encouragement that I saw only in James's room. Thank you for visiting so often, for being his cheerleader, for doing his exercises with him. You spent a lot of time there, and I'm grateful, honey. I know Uncle James appreciated it too, because one day Taylor and I had one of those mother-daughter discussions before I went up to the hospital. And I was kind of upset, but James, through his vent with his mouth, he very plainly mouthed me, I like her. <laughs> Let's talk about the power of community. We have a community at Terex, we have a community here at church, we have a community at Woolsey Westington School, we have one at James Valley, we have one right here in the front called the Cheddar Family. You put all this together, you have a really strong community to support you. Thank you for those who did the Woolsey Westington benefit, the Terex lunch benefit. Some of you I know mowed lawns. Doesn't seem like a long time to be sick if you mowed lawns and shoveled snow. And yet you guys did both of those too. People helped with that big benefit at the Elks. Meals, we had people bring all kinds of meals and help at the farm as well. People help find far or lodging for Lisa and Fargo, visited the hospital, transported people and cars, and helped us get back and forth, and prayed for James and our entire family. <coughs> Lisa commented to the newspaper when we did that article with Crystal. And today I Crystal asked her, how are you getting through this? And she said, my church. And, support of other people, and she said prayers. And Lisa went on to say, you know, I go home, and I'm exhausted, and I'm tired, and I fall into bed, and I'm too tired to pray. But it's okay, because I know other people are praying. So thank you for being those other people who pray. This day, I'm saying a temporary goodbye James. I 
I loved him dearly. And this day, my brother is in heaven, and he has been welcomed by Jesus' arms. And those who've gone before him, my dad, Uncle Trevor, Uncle Larry, Cousin Jay, Grandma's and Grandpa's, he is whole, he is healed, and he's smiling that smirky smile, and he has this twinkle in his eye, and I can just see my Grandma Lizzie greet him and say something, so have a big smile, she'd say something like this, look who's coming in here, my Jane.
thank you for all the people who shared. Let's give everyone a hand. My turn now, and you know, when I came to town in 07, uh, we moved here. Shortly after that, that we moved, uh, James had an uh, automobile accident east of town. And so, my recollection of James is that he was always a fighter. He was always fighting to get better. And uh, it seems like since I've known him these past seven years, that's been the case. However, I did was able to go out to the farm with him and enjoy his company and so forth. I enjoyed that a lot. Today, uh, you should have been blessed so far with the words that were spoken. That song is powerful. I don't think I've heard that before, but how appropriate, how applicable is that song? And the words are powerful. And uh, so, what Janice said and what Bailey just sung. Those words are biblical, they're God's words, and that's exactly what happened. What they sang was, is truth. And my job is going to be easy because James told me what to preach on. Okay, so, uh, and I got that very clear from Bailey when we met. Uh, she said, Dad said, preach on John 3.16. So, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to follow his wishes, and it's a very easy verse to preach on, but I tell you what I'm going to do, I'm going to read verses 14 through uh, 18, I think, so follow along because there's a context here. Every verse is important, of course, John 3.16 is John 3.16, that's the most familiar verse in all the world of the Bible, and that's the one you learn in Sunday school as a kid. Bible school, or whatever the case may be, you will learn John 3, 16. But I'm going to start in verse 14. So listen to God's word. He says, and Jesus is speaking. He says, as Moses lift, lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Again, it's amazing that this most familiar verse in all of Christendom, John 3, 16, was spoken at night, in the dark, because a man by the name of Nicodemus came to Jesus at night by dark. He was a ruler of the Jews. He was a Pharisee. And although the Bible doesn't tell us, I'm sure, I can be sure as best I can, that the reason he came to Jesus at night and in the dark was because he really didn't want his other Pharisee friends to see him come. But he had some very important questions that he wanted to, he was a seeker. He was seeking some answers from the Lord Jesus Christ. So this whole conversation, John 3, 16, and the following verses and so forth, all happened one night with one individual. And uh, Jesus also spoke earlier in some earlier verses about the need for the new birth, about the need to be born again. Again, just with one guy. We have it in our Bible, and uh, the whole world has heard that message from one time or another. You must be born again, and uh, John 3.16 is proclaimed in many, many places. But it was just a conversation with one seeking man on one night. And I'm just going to mention this, a couple of things here, and then we'll be done. <laughs> Jesus uses this Old Testament illustration. We kind of jumped in, in our reading, we kind of jumped right into the middle of the passages and so forth. And so we started with that illustration, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. The reason Moses lifted up that serpent on a stick, way high, that bronze serpent, made of serpent out of bronze, and lifted it way up high in the air, the reason he did that was because the nation of Israel had offended God. 
And so God sent some snakes amongst them, <coughs> poisonous snakes, and they were biting the people, and the people were dying. But God also had a plan to take care of that. And he told Moses to make a bronze serpent, a, a, a bronze thing in the form of a serpent, put it on a pole, lift that pole high in the air, and if anyone is bitten by a poisonous snake, all he has to do is look at that pole. That's it. All he has to do is look at that pole. He doesn't have to say a bunch of words. He doesn't have to go to a certain place. Just look at that pole and he would be healed. Look at that serpent and he would be healed. And so Jesus used that illustration for a New Testament truth. That happened in the Old Testament. But he was leading Nicodemus into a New Testament truth. So he goes on to say, uh, that whoever believes in the Son should have everlasting life. So the Old Testament truth, an offense was committed, God provided the plan, a bronze serpent on a pole, and a simple look would bring healing. Fast forward into the New Testament in Jesus' day, an offense was committed, and God provided the plan. The plan is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's the plan. Now isn't God gracious to us? Wasn't he gracious to those people in the Old Testament? They committed the offense against God. They committed the sin. Yet God in his mercy and in his grace, he provided the plan whereby they could be healed. And now in our world today, we offend God. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We offend God, and God in His grace and in His mercy provides a plan, provides a way that we can overcome that and be saved and go to heaven when we die. God has provided that plan for us. It involves the love of God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It involves God's love to give his son. It involves the love of the son to give his life on a cross. And then it involves the cross being lifted up. And then it involves simple faith to bring salvation. So it's the same, it's a parallel. The New Testament is a parallel of the Old Testament story that Jesus brought out. And he brought it out for that reason. As Moses lifted the serpent in the wilderness, he said, Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There's a couple of differences here. One difference is, is that the Old Testament, when they looked on that serpent, they got physical healing. And that's good, and that's fine, and that's great. And you're sick, you want physical healing. You're glad to get it. It didn't provide them eternal life. But the, the cross in the New Testament gives us eternal life, and that's the difference. When the Son of God is lifted up, when Jesus is lifted up, He is lifted up because He died on the cross for our sins. And that's the only thing that's going to keep us from heaven. Did you know that? Is our sin. That's it. That's what's going to keep you. Somebody doesn't make it to heaven. If you're here today, and in a hundred years from now, you find that you're not in heaven, it will be because of sin that didn't get you there. That's it. God has provided a way for you to have your sins forgiven. And I talked to James about this. I talked to James about this a couple of times. There must have been a time when he was baptized. I can't remember what year that was, but he was baptized in, in this church. I wasn't here many years before I came. But there must have been a time where James heard this same message you're hearing today. Similar. Maybe he was sitting in a church. I don't know. Maybe it was a Sunday school class. Or maybe it was a vacation Bible school. Or maybe he attended camp out north of or maybe he was at home with his parents, with his mom. I don't know. But somewhere along the line, James sensed 
and understood that message in his mind. The message is, I, James, am a sinner, and I'm not going to make it to heaven on my own. I know that Jesus Christ came down from heaven to die on the cross, and the purpose he died on the cross and shed his blood was so that my sins could be forgiven. Christ took the payment I deserve to take. He took it upon his own body when he was lifted up on the cross. And Jesus rose from the dead, went back to heaven, and James must have said something like this. I don't know. I didn't hear him, but everybody does this a little different way. But by and large, they say something like, you know, I'm going, I'm going to receive Jesus Christ into my life as my personal Savior. And when James did that, whatever the occasion was, Sunday school class, church service, home, uh, wherever, when he did that, that moment he made a transaction. He said, I will take Christ, and Christ can take my sin. And that moment, salvation came to James. Let me tell you something. Right now, James is very, very happy that he made that decision. He is very happy. He is eternally grateful right now that he made that decision. James has been in heaven now for a few days. And whatever, whatever, I, I don't think there's any such thing as day and night in heaven, but whatever heaven would hold for a believer, whatever perfect thing is there for us, we just get a few things in Scripture, whatever it is, James is experiencing that. And he will thank God for eternity that God spoke to his heart that one day, whenever that was, and James heard the call and sensed in his heart that God was calling him to himself. And James responded by saying, yes, Lord, I will take you as my personal Savior. And that's it. James didn't go to heaven because he was a member of this church. He didn't go to heaven because he was a trustee of this church. He didn't go to heaven because he was a fine father. And a fine husband, that's all good. We would not negate that at all. That's not how you get to heaven. That's not it. Those are all fine and good qualities. You get to heaven by making that transaction, by understanding in your heart and your mind that you need somebody beyond yourself, that your sin is keeping you from heaven, but that Christ became your sin bearer and your substitute and your sacrifice on the cross so he suffered your sins, so you don't have to suffer for your sins. And you and Christ come together, and you're saved. That's how that happens. It's not church membership. It's not baptism. It's not being a good guy, a good husband, a good father, a good worker, working in the community, giving money. None of those things. And that's all fine and good in and of themselves. But they'll never get you to heaven. You have to take Jesus Christ into your heart as your personal Savior. So the New Testament plan, an offense is committed, God provided the plan. The love of God gave His Son. The love of the Son gave Himself. The cross was lifted up. Simple faith brings salvation. I look at the cross, I realize that Christ died on it for my sins. I received Christ into my life, and I'm saved. Did you know, those of you who are friends, family perhaps, did you know that James wanted me to speak on this subject for your sake? Not for my benefit, but for your sake. He was concerned. He didn't say who he was concerned about. But he wants his friends to be in heaven with him forever. Isn't that a blessing? You see, when you end the near, when you when you when you come to the end of your life, things take on a different perspective. You find out what's really important in life, and some of the other things that you might have thought were important a few years ago just don't seem to be important. Anymore. And what was important to James at the end of his life was not only the fact of knowing that he was going to heaven, but also wanting his friends to be there as well. Now, verse 17 and 18 goes on to say this. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And then verse 18, and we're going to close with this. He who believes in him, that is Christ, is not judged. 
He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So there's two kinds of people in the world, and more importantly, there's two kinds of people here in this room and downstairs, here in this building. Two kinds of people. There are people who are not under condemnation, and then there's another group of folks here that are under con condemnation. Now that's what verse 18 says. He who believes in him is not judged or is not condemned. He who does not believe has been condemned already. So you don't have to wait until you die to find out where you're going to go. If you thought that in your life, you've been mistaken. You make that decision before you die because if you wait until after you die, your, your doom is already seen. You have to make that decision before you die. So here in this room, there's a group of folks who are not condemned. Why is that? Is it because they're better than other people? Is it because they got a little more money than other people? Is it because maybe they were baptized or maybe they joined the church? No, none of those things. It is because in simple faith they looked at the cross of Jesus Christ, realizing he died for their sins, and they in the privacy of their heart and in their minds received Jesus Christ into their lives. They trusted in him to become their personal savior. He honored their faith just like that they were saved. Just like that they were saved. I don't know who they are in this room that are like that. I know I, I'm not the judge. Thank goodness. Then again, there's some other folks in this room who are condemned already. Not when, not, when you, not when you die, you're condemned already. You have to get out of that state of condemnation and come into the state of not being condemned. Who are they? I have no idea who their names are. And if I look at you, I wouldn't know who you are. That's not my business to judge. You know that, though. And your job right now is in the privacy of your own heart, in the privacy of your own mind, recognize that God is calling you. You can sense that. I'm speaking to some people now who can sense that. I don't know who you are, but God the Holy Spirit does not He's speaking to your heart. You can sense that He's drawing you to Christ. You can sense, you can understand now that Christ died on the cross for your sins. Oh, you've heard that for 30 years. But you sense, you sense it for you that He died. And it's becoming personal to you. That's God speaking to you. Let Him talk to you. Listen to His voice. And you sense that if you would receive Christ into your life today, you could be saved. You sense that. That's God speaking to you. And you're ready to move from the group that's condemned already to the group that is no longer condemned. You're ready to do that. Now, we're never going to meet like this again. This group will never, ever, ever, in the, as long as the world shall end, and in all of eternity, will meet like this ever again. This is a unique situation. God is speaking to your heart. He's speaking to your heart because your friend died. And if James could see us, I don't know if he can, but if he could, he'd be rooting on and saying, yes, accept Christ. I could tell you if I could come back, I could, I could jump up and down and tell you, accept Christ. Accept Christ as your Savior. Do it today. Do it now. And I would say that too. Don't wait. Don't wait for a better time. There is no better time. The Bible says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. You never want to trust in tomorrow. Number one, tomorrow may never come. But number two, if it does come, if it does come, you may not have that sense and that feeling that you do right now that you ought to do business with God. If you want to see James again, He's in heaven. That's where you'll have to go. If you want to get to heaven, you'll have to come through the Lord Jesus Christ. Not my church, not anybody's church. You'll have to come through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's He. He's the one that died on the cross. Jesus said, And I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And I believe that He's drawing some people here today. Which group are you in? Which group do you want to be? That choice is totally yours. 
Let's bow our heads in the word of prayer. Now while heads are bowed and their eyes are closed, there are some people here today and God has spoken to you. You sense that. You feel that in your heart. You sense that this should be your day to receive Christ into your life. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make it very easy. I'm going to help you with that. You're doing business with God, not with me, not with this church. You're doing business with God Almighty Himself. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And you pray silently, but you're praying to God. You want to pray sincerely. You want to pray in faith, believing in Christ. Christ died for you and rose from the dead. And you want to ask Him to come into your life as your personal Savior. You're going to do that today. And it's going to be signed and sealed and settled forever. And one day when you pass away, 10, 20, 30 years from now, whenever it may be, you will be forever grateful that you made that decision today. If you don't make that decision, you will be eternally ungrateful that you didn't make that decision. So I'm speaking to those whom the Lord has spoken to in this room. If you want to be saved, if you want to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you want your sins to be taken away today, you pray this prayer to him, silently to him, not to me or anybody. Pray it to him. Just say these words. <coughs> say, Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know you died on the cross for my sins. Come into my heart. And become my personal Savior today. I receive you right now. And thank you for saving me. Amen. Father, I want to thank you for those who made that decision. Lord, we know that you bring us together in a crowd like this. In an event like this, in a situation like this, for a specific purpose. Oh, we come because we're just going to do this and we're going to do that. Yet behind the scenes, you're working in people's hearts. You draw people to a certain place <coughs> at a certain time so they can hear this message. And they have this opportunity to never come again to receive you. I thank you for those people who did that today. Lord, I thank you that there will be people in heaven because James passed away because he had a concern in his heart for his friends and he wanted to see them saved. Lord, we thank you for his concern, for your message, for your way of salvation. Thank you for that. Now, Father, we do want to continue in our prayer and ask you to comfort the family, bless the family, strengthen them, Lord, today, throughout this day. Make sure they're exhausted. They're just kind of running on, on fumes right now, Lord. And uh, we pray that you'll grant them the strength to get through the rest of this day. Talking to a lot of people, crying with a lot of people. And, uh, Lord, we pray that you'll give them a good night's rest tonight. We pray that tomorrow you'll grant them strength and the next day and the next day. And then the weeks will go by and they'll need your comfort even more so later than they do today. And there'll be some lonely nights and there'll be some lonely times. They'll be crying when they can't figure out why. And Lord, we pray that at those times that you will be very present with them, very near to them, very close to them, and that they will lean upon you and trust your plan. Lord, I pray now that you will bless this day. I ask thank you for the food that's been prepared for us, Lord. I pray that you'll bless this food, strengthen us, encourage us, and nourish us, and help us to serve you better. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now Paul is going to come up and lead us in a song. And uh, we want you to stand and the family will be ushered out and then you will be ushered out as a Would you stand please?
James Cheddar. And the Cheddar family has went through a journey that's been courageous. Your testimony to the grace of God and the faith in Jesus Christ. And the impact of me, this church, and our community. Let's sing together.
yourself. Um, the service is ended. It's going to take a while for everyone to get out and for we'll just be playing some music. <coughs> Yeah.